So yeah, our goal is actually to make language extension practical. And so just to start off talking about you know, what I mean by language extension, here's a, examples of the kinds of things that we might want to introduce to C. Uh, and so we might want to you know, improve C's data representation model by introducing algebraic data types, I'll stand closer. Uh, and we might want to you know, import some kinds of uh, parallel computing models, for example, these silk extensions to uh, C for doing uh, concurrent computing. And you know, sometimes we just have little demands where we want little helpers. So we have a little regular expression matching and regular expression literals that we might want to write in C and make it a little bit more Perl-like for a certain application. Uh, different application demands call for different things. This isn't something we ever hope to have in one language to rule them all uh, kind of situation. And so the trouble with language extension is that in order to implement you know, these kinds of extensions that I've shown you, we really need to do, you know, we're introducing new syntax, but we also need to do new tree analysis just to go back real quickly. For example, when we annotate functions with silk, uh, this uh, silk runtime requires there to be essentially two different functions that we generate from this. And so we have to be able to take a look at the implementation of this function and generate those two transformed functions uh, to support that. And so we need new syntax and new analysis uh, as things that we can support with our language extensions. And we choose to kind of frame this as looking at the expression problem applied to the abstract syntax tree. Uh, and so we want certain nice properties about this, the ability to compose these, uh, or to uh, specify extensions that extend these two things. Uh, and there's also sort of the independent extensibility problem. My uh, footnotes have disappeared from the slide. Oh well. Uh, independent extensibility problem, so expression problem was Wadler, uh, independent exp uh, extensibility was uh, Utterski. Um, and so this was the observation that, well, all right, if we solve the expression problem, we can sort of tack on new analysis and new syntax, but we can't sort of compose those two things together. Um, and we want to go one step further, which is making sure that we can actually do automatic composition, which comes to that problem of, well, you have syntax and analysis. Something has now to implement this uh, intersection between these two things. Um, and it's not n enough to just say, oh, you have a problem here. We need to automatically solve it. And the reason that we want that is because we are pursuing what we call the library model of language extension which is pretty much, we want you to be able to import language extensions like libraries. And so independent extension developers are producing their little extensions, but we don't ever see this final composed language with a particular set of extensions until the user, this programmer, is putting them together and they're the one who gets this composed artifact that could be entirely novel. Nobody's put that combination together before. Um, and so that's the point where things can go wrong. And the problem is these users are not compilers experts. They do not want to debug their compiler. And so if we think uh, for language extension to really be a practical thing, that uh, experience that the user has has to be flawless. It needs to just work. They just need to have these new language extensions that they want. And so we want to put the burden on our languages and compilers experts, us, uh, in developing our extensions. Uh, and so to make sure that these things will actually work together. So the distinguishing characteristic of our approach, you know, this isn't the new, you know, we're not proposing language extension as a novel thing. There were international conferences on extensible languages back in the 1970s. Uh, we have several different kinds of modern systems. So I'm just going to mention sort of extend J and sugar J, uh, two uh, systems like this for Java. Uh, Embedder, which is a system somewhat like this uh, for uh, something like C. Uh, using projectional editing to solve syntax problems. And there's been other uh, tools for building accessible C compilers as well. And of course, there's also macro systems in general. Uh, but what we really think distinguishes our work from all of these pr all of this prior work is just who composes this language, these language features. A lot of these systems are, you know, they support composable language extensions, but they target it to compilers experts. They let you compose together some features and create an extended compiler that you can then give to users to actually use because things can go wrong during that composition process. And the second question is how expressive are the supported features? Um, it's actually, you know, you could call Clang an extensible compiler if all you say is there's no new language extensions, it's just we're writing new analysis passes over these trees because uh, it's just implemented as visitors. So when you really, it's the combination of these things of we want to make sure that the end user who's composing these things, nothing's going wrong and we're actually supporting rich, interesting extensions. Uh, and so to some extent what I'm here to report is success. Uh, so we have built two tools called Copper and Silver. Copper is a parser generator 
Um, and Silver is our attribute grammar based programming language. And if you implement a programming language, a compiler, uh, using these tools, uh, you are able to then build language extensions in these tools for that compiler. And so ABLE-C is our application of these tools to C. And so ABLE-C is our, our tool for supporting a reliable composition of extensions. Uh, so just to sort of frame your expectations here, the model we have in mind is, well, you take ABLE-C, you pick a few extensions that you want, it spits out your compiler, that process is flawless, and then you're able to uh, use that compiler uh, to generate a uh, uh, plain C code, so we translate away all these extensions, and, that, and you can just pass that through GCC to get your object file. Um, our previous work that we were relying on in order to make this happen is two things that sort of allow us to make expressive extensions. One of these is context-aware scanning, uh, and this eliminates a lot of the problems, doesn't guarantee things work yet, but it eliminates a lot of the problems we have when you try introducing multiple independent bits of syntax into the same language. Uh, and another tool called forwarding in uh, attribute grabbers uh, that is a tool for solving that problem when you have the intersection of new analysis and new syntax uh, being composed together. And then in order to make these tools actually effective and fully work in terms of completely eliminating the problems for the end user, we have to what we call modular analyses. So modular analysis is just something like type checking. It's something you apply on your module and then it guarantees some property holds of the global program when you compose modules together. So the modular determinism analysis looks, uh, looks at the syntax you're introducing to an extension and makes sure that it, it constrains it a little bit, uh, but it makes sure that no problems will sh uh, show up when the end user composes together those multiple pieces of syntax. And the modular will define this analysis, does something similar for the attribute grammar. It makes sure that it constrains your extension a little bit and it makes sure that the uh, composed uh, attribute grammar for your compiler will be well-defined. Uh, and concurrently with uh, ABLE-C, we've also gone and solved sort of the last piece of this problem, which is uh, what we call coherent non-interference. Uh, and this sort of concerns itself with the values computed for those attributes on your attribute grammar to make sure that your extensions are actually behaving the way you wanted them to. Uh, and so you can kind of prove that your extension works in isolation and that proof will still hold on the composed compiler. Um, I could talk a little bit about what those particular extensions were, uh, but I think I want to try to skip that to use ABLE-C to answer the more interesting questions, which is what kinds of extensions can we build to C? Um, what kinds of extensions can't we build because these analyses have imposed restrictions on us? And what kind of host language changes might we want to make to allow for more kinds of extensions? Because one of the interesting things about these analyses is that they're all at least partially host language relative. There's this kind of space surrounding a host language implementation of things that you can implement as reliably composable extensions, and then there's other things that you are not able to uh, implement. So just to go back to this kinds of exa uh, example, um, these were real examples. These are extensions that we built for ABLE-C. And so uh, our algebraic data type extension is something where we can declare new data types and we can implement pattern matching expressions. But one thing that we cannot do with this, uh, for example, is allow these data types to be parameterized. So we can write data type tree here, but there's a reason we chose tree as our example and not list or pair or other traditional things that you see with languages, and that is because we cannot, um, one of our constraints is that when we are, uh, this extension tr has to be able to translate away to something that it is equivalent to in the plain C host language, and the C's type system has no generic types in it. And so there's nothing that's actually equivalent to those parameterized types. Whereas with uh, monomorphic, I guess, uh, algebraic data types, uh, these are something that you do have some equivalence to. You can translate down to structs, unions, enums, and it's um, something you can represent. Um, so something like the pattern match, this is something we can perfectly capable of implementing. However, we have the slightly added constraint um, that we have to implement it in the right way. And so the right way in this case is that when we're analyzing host language trees, um, for example, a tree representing a data type that we just got out of the environment, which is a data, um, the environment is something the host language had specified, we need to be able to analyze uh, that as if it were just host language trees. And so when we have to implement sort of our uh, exhaustive matching analysis and our pattern matching uh, expressions or statements, uh, we need to be able to go and say, well, all right, my analysis has to work equally well between my uh, extension data type and the 
extension data types translation that I see when I look things up in the environment. So if I look up data type tree, I have to be able to implement an exhaustive pattern matching check equally well whether I see data type tree or I see struct, enum, union, struct, uh, and so forth. And, you know, and another small constraint that we have is syntactically, a lot of these extensions have to start with what we call marking tokens. And this is the only point of syntactic conflict that you can get between extensions. And it's the same kind of conflict you can get when you're importing libraries. Two things define the same names. And so we allow you to solve that problem in the same way, which is put prefixes on those names and disambiguate it. So if we look here, we see data type, silk, spawn. Um, so these are the marking tokens for these particular syntactic hooks. And we see in the middle here on the right side, we have a new infix, or a new binary operator for doing like regular expression matching. Now, this is not something that you're necessarily able to do unless the host language is designed a particular way. It just turns out that in C, we often factor out the concrete syntax in a way um, where we are able to introduce these new binary operators. So our constraint is when you're introducing a new extension to the host language, it has to be host language non-terminal marking token, and then your arbitrary <laughs> extension syntax. Uh, so if you wrote expert terminal expert, then you are not able to introduce new binary operators. Whereas if you have expert, I have a non-terminal for my bin ops and expert, then you're able to go to that bin op and add something new. And so this is a little way in which you can start to see some constraints. You might not be able to uh, build new binary operators for some languages. Um, so another thing that we were inspired to build was uh, a halide-like extension. Uh, a lot of our applications, we looked at scientific code that uh, they had sort of manually performed a lot of transformations on in order to get it to perform to the way that they wanted it to. So we wanted to allow something that lets us write the code in the original, clearly, clearly comprehensible manner uh, that you are used to, and then uh, programmatically transform this in order to implement optimizations that your compiler probably can't do automatically because they're not always applicable. Um, and so in this example, we're doing something where we take, uh, I believe this is matrix multiplication, just a very simple, <coughs> excuse me, example, uh, parallelizing it. Uh, in a certain way, then we're deciding each of those threads is going to tile um, uh, their inner loops so that we get some cache coherency and then we can split things up so that we can make sure that the inner loop is vectorizing, um, you know, the innermost operations. Uh, and so that's extremely useful source of extensions that we've um, been trying to apply. And another area, I used to have a really nice demo back when I had a MATLAB license. Uh, is I think is a really cool application area, is um, foreign function interfaces. And so this was an extension we built that allowed us to write, okay, I'm just declaring a MATLAB function, something I want to be able to use through the MEX function extension system uh, in MATLAB. And I write a type signature for this function that looks similar to what you would write in MATLAB to define a function. And then you can just write your ordinary function in C at this point. And so there's a huge number of things that ends up being able to do for you. Um, you know, uh, MATLAB has several different representations where things could get uh, passed into your functions, and so it can do conversions, it can do type checking, it can do uh, dimension checking, uh, and so on. And so we, uh, this was originally from an example that sort of computed a picture of the Mandelbrot set, and the uh, translated code spends more time marshalling and unmarshalling data to and from MATLAB's representation than it does drawing this picture. Uh, and so this extension eliminated it all into just a little function type signature, which I thought was really cool. Uh, so we built a couple of other extensions, uh, different concurrency models, uh, language integrated query-like extensions for SQLite. Uh, I'm gonna skip those because I'm a little bit short on time. And I wanna talk about sort of the limitations on extensions in a different way, which is what we were motivated to change about our ABLE-C host language implementation to try to support more extensions. Um, so one of the things that we kind of got saved by was that we had to support GCC extensions. And so this turned out to be especially useful because one of the problems you have with uh, your extensions when you're trying to introduce new expressions is you sometimes need to be able to do statement-like things. 
Um, and so this is a sort of problem with stratified grammars when you have declaration statement expression and you're in, inside of an expression and you need something that's equivalent to an expression but you need to do some uh, sequence of operations or something like that. And so GCC statement expressions kind of saved us already, um, but these turned out to be quite useful things that we often use in our extension, language extension implementations. Uh, operator overloading, something that we uh, uh, found really, really strongly useful. Um, it's somewhat annoying to have to uh, use a marking token in a lot of cases to be able to indicate, ah, I'm in an extension. I am now sort of you know, hooked into being able to analyze these trees and transform them however I want. So being able to leverage the type system uh, to hook into sort of this addition node and be able to analyze those subtrees and change them into, transform them into whatever we want was extremely useful. Uh, another thing that we often had to deal with was uh, the problem of lifting. So if we want to do something like a little lambda expressions to see anonymous functions, we had two things uh, that we have to do here. One is we have to you know, translate this to, to a top level function because there's no nested functions in C. Um, and two is we really need to have a closure type in order to be able to pass this lambda thing around. And so we had to do, you know, instantiate this closure type specific to this function uh, at the top level. And then who knows where that type ends up escaping as it gets passed around. And finally, um, one of the other sort of general problems that we have in limitations is that we have trouble doing annotation driven analysis. And so this is a uh, case of something, for example, here if we want to put non-null annotations on pointers, so this is a syntactic thing, but then you want to implement an analysis that tries to make sure that you're not dereferencing anything you don't know to be non-null, uh, you aren't able in that analysis to always necessarily see, you can't rely on seeing uh, your extension syntax. You have to be, again, um, analyzing things in a way that's equivalent between your extension and the host language, and if there's nothing equivalent in the host language to forward to, then you have a problem. And so we extended our host language, uh, or we, excuse me, we uh, modified our host language uh, to support some of these kinds of things uh, to be able to implement those kinds of extensions. Uh, and so one of the things I would note here is just uh, summarizing those kinds of things is the host language type system turned out to be really important. Uh, this is a thing where we can't really extend the type system because a lot of what we think about as extensions for type systems are really semantically new. They're not things that are inex inexpressible uh, with the previous safe system, whereas we de often didn't have this problem with the expression language or anything like that. It's a Turing complete language. You can just do whatever. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we kind of had this extended notion of this expression problem uh, that we think is what we wanted for making language extension practical. We have a system where we can reliably compose these language extensions. We think there's a breadth of extensions that are possible to build in the system. Um, and we think, uh, as a concluding observation, I think language extension system like this has an interesting impact on language design because we have this clear picture of what kinds of things can be implemented as a language extension versus what that really constitutes a change. Uh, you know, we, um, this can help us focus our attention when we're designing languages. And of course, if we can implement things as an extension, we can get experience using them before we finalize designs and put them in standards and things like that. So thank you. Uh, we do have an artifact if you want to play around with this. Very easy to just clone and vagrant up a VM and play around, do whatever you want with it. Thank you. <laughs>